Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Genesee Spotlights. I'm John Katarski, your host. This evening, we're going to take a look at the Flynn Institute of Arts. You know, when Alex de Tocqueville arrived here in 1831, he was struck by the paradox of the people he found living here. On the one hand, this was a very harsh environment. Swampland, mosquitoes, wild animals. Yet the people he found living here had an uncommon intellectual curiosity. They spoke several European languages and many of the local Indian dialects, drank out of China teacups, and read Milton and Shakespeare. Early Flint had a very progressive reputation. So it's no wonder that a private art school was formed here in the 1920s. And that's where our story begins. On a cold January day in 1927, Frank Stevenson formed the Flint School of Art and Design. He had eight students. It was located in the center building on the Saginaw Street Bridge. Back then, the bridge had buildings from Water Street north to First Avenue. Frank didn't know it, but an art school was exactly what Flint wanted and needed. It was less than a year before two strong-willed women, Mrs. Bruce McDonald and Mrs. Walter Winchester, became convinced that the fledging art school should be purchased and expanded into a community art center. And that's just what they did. First, they convinced George Crapo Wilson of the idea, which wasn't hard. He had community spirit in his blood. His grandfather was Henry Crapo, an early Flint pioneer leader, and a lumber baron, and the 15th governor of the state of Michigan. Well, between the three of them, they raised $10,000. And on January 28, in 1928, they purchased the Flint School of Art and Design. They asked Ray Strong, who was then head of the art department of the Flint Printing Company, to supervise the students. And before long, there were over 150 enrolled. A public dinner was held at the Dran Hotel, where the main speaker was Dudley Watson from the Chicago Institute of Arts. He stressed the importance of developing the industrial arts, as well as keeping abreast of the trends happening in Europe at the time, and encouraging the creative work of artists we had working right here in our own community. On April 2nd, 1928, it was decided to change the name to the Flint Institute of Arts and rent space here at the Bronson Fisher Building on the second floor. Adrian Dornbush was appointed its first director. He was a protege of Dudley Watson from the Chicago Institute of Arts. And in the winter of that year, a very important event occurred. On February 18, 1929, Michael A. Gorman was elected to the Board of Directors of the Flint Institute of Arts. He came to Flint a few months earlier to be editor of the Flint Journal, that prize jewel in the Booth newspaper chain. By 1930, the Institute had outgrown its space and looked for larger quarters. It found it at Rio Salmon's Garage that was located here on the corner of First Avenue and Beach Street. The Rio Salmon's Garage building was wonderful. You opened the big 12-panel oak door and walked up, I think, 20-some steps, but at the top of the steps was some beautiful painting, and that was the hallway, you know, and uh, the desk was to the left, and to the left of that was the lithography room, and uh, there was a little storeroom behind the secretary's desk, and further on was the big studio, lighted from the north and from the east. Uh, I think the ceiling must have been 10 feet, but it, it, it was just wonderful. It smelled great because casein paint at the time, the stuff we used on paper was called Texalite. It had a beautiful, beautiful aroma. You know, it was a pleasure to walk up to the studio, grab the manila paper, thumbtack it on a board and go to work. I remember being taken there by my Aunt Mary and because my mother was busy with other children and we took the streetcar down and I was enrolled. And I think it was through the public school uh, program, but this was underwritten, if I am not mistaken, by Mary Bishop. I'm quite certain that she asked around the city for people that might be interested in furthering their artistic studies. It was magic. I wanted to be an artist. I think every kid in the class wanted to be an artist. Uh, we, we didn't know that much. We only knew a few 
highlights. We knew that Rivera painted some frescoes in Detroit, and that was quite, that was quite close. I didn't read the newspapers a lot or, or whatever. Uh, I didn't know that he went to New York to paint a big fresco until uh, Bill Croft introduced me to the Dimitrovs who lived next door to uh, uh, his mother's on Dewey Street. And uh, the creative climate was uh, Thomas Hart Benton is a great painter, John Stuart Curry is a great painter, Grant Wood is stylistically very interesting. We saw lithographs of his. Uh, George Gross was uh, a great person. You know, it, it was, okay, in a, in a word, it was, uh, we're, we're sort of like involved with our immediate environment and people more than ideas, more than ideas about what is art all about anyway. Brozik was great when we would, we would study uh, uh, old master paintings and would go through composition and how these things held together and uh, what makes a painting, you know, what makes a great work of art. Uh, I remember one afternoon uh, just looking at black and white reproductions of frescoes that Orozco did and uh, how he indicated how the black pattern wove itself so miraculously through these fresco panels. and you know, the, the directional lines and so on and so forth. And uh, that was the climate. Uh, we knew Ed Ferguson existed, Basil Hawkins existed, uh, Bob, uh, uh, there, was an, uh, there was a Bob, someone or other that drew very well, you know, uh, John Davies. We knew about Zoltan Sepeshi. We knew about the Michigan Artist Show that we all tried getting into. And Jack Lazar did get into it one year when he was, what, 16 or 17 years old. <laughs> so he was the greatest artist in Flint. <laughs> you know, that was the climate. What we call the Fine Arts Ball. And yes, we painted decorations for that. The students painted decorations. They were quite huge, 8 feet by 10 feet on paper. They were stretched out on the floor of the Rio Salmon's garage. And, uh, you know, there was an exhibit maybe on the walls, but people had to be very careful because Rudy LaRiviera had a big mural on paper he was painting. Bob Calhoun had one, Ed Ferguson had one, maybe Basil Hawkins and Ed Ferguson had one. Uh, and these decorations were painted to uh, hang in the ballroom of the Durand Hotel. And it was the fine arts ball. People dressed in costumes, you know. We were invited, can you believe? We were teenagers, but we were invited to the shindig. I don't, we didn't participate in any of the fancy dinners or anything, but we arrived on the scene, maybe eight or nine o'clock in the evening, and uh, you know, we were taken downstairs where the little bar was set up, and I think, what did we drink? Lemonade and Coca-Cola? Teenagers, you know, drinking lemonade and Coca-Cola on Bohemian night, so. And people danced till what, two or three in the morning, for heaven's sakes. And uh, then we were driven home. And uh, we were led to believe that um, this is part of the artist's life, that uh, you know, he's gotta have a blowout every so often. And uh, it's good to get the artist and the patron together and have a party. In 1941, the Institute wanted its own building. So it purchased the Congregational Church located on First Street. It's where the Bell Telephone Building is today. It stayed here until 1958. That's when the Institute became involved in an extraordinary experiment. The idea was simple enough. Raise $30 million privately among your friends and build a cultural center that included music, art, history, theater, throwing a planetarium for good measure. The idea was the brainchild of none other than Michael A. Gorman. It was such a grand idea, it needed a small, intimate space to be presented adequately. So a small Cape Cod on Calumet Street that was the home of Mike Gorman was it. It became affectionately known as the Club Calumet. Good evening. You're in for a real treat tonight. We're in the Club Calumet, Mike Gorman's 
fanciful club where he and people of the 40s and the 50s in Flint laid the plans which formed the basis for Flint's College and Cultural Center. Yet these chairs and, and being served from this bar were quite likely to have been people like Dr. Fleming Barber, C.S. Mott, Mike Gorman, and the others that were around in Flint. Now, over here in the, on these varied benches, it's quite possible that you might have seen C.S. Mott or Tony DiLorenzo laying the plans, doing the kinds of things, hatching the plots as it were almost, that eventually came into being as Flint's College and Cultural Center and the 30 million, more importantly, the 30 million dollars that it took to get us going. One of the individuals who visited the Club Kelly Met in those years is here tonight, Dr. Fleming Barber. Let's go over and talk to him for a few minutes. Dr. Barber, we're sitting here in the Club Calumet in this little intimate setting that uh, uh, you remember. You, you were here at, at, and on a few occasions, weren't you, or several occasions? This is one of the great experiences in Flint to be invited to Club Calumet. Exclusive kind of an event? Well, in a way, it sort of recognized the fact maybe you'd done something or maybe Mike hoped you could do something. But uh, Mike had something in mind. Anybody ever invited here? It just didn't. Ha it just didn't happen by by uh, by chance. You just didn't drop off the street and say, "I'd like to come in and see your club, Mike." I see. When did they usually meet here at the club? What were the well, occasions? Well, Mike would have special dinners here or special meetings. But generally speaking, the uh, most of us came in after a United Way meeting, a Red Feather meeting. Uh, maybe a hospital board meeting or something Mike had in mind for the community. That was the time when he socialized and pumped you for ideas and told you what he thought should be done. What was the Club Calumet? How would you describe it? Well, it was a little house on Calumet Avenue in Flint. And I lived around the corner from there on uh, Blanchard Street. And uh, we, we got together there frequently and it was kind of a mecca for influential people in Flint to come to Mike Gorman's Club Calumet for a drink or a visit or lunch or Sunday lunch or brunch, whatever. And uh, he had some very interesting guests, you know, Dean of the Medical School of the University of Michigan, governors. Uh, I met Admiral Hart there during World War II, who was in charge of our Pacific forces. Uh, just a, a, a very influential group of people. And people like Charles Stewart Martin, Bob Longway and Dutch Bauer and all the Flint people would assemble there. How did you get an invitation to the, how would one get an in, going about getting an invitation to the Club Calumet? Well, I don't know that you'd ever be able to persuade anybody to invite you, but you had to be invited by Mike or his secretary. She would call and say there'd be a gathering and that Mr. Gorman would very much like to have you there. So you went. Hardly dare refuse command performance? It was a command performance, yes. But it was a, a very stimulating experience, so you always always went. Well, always what, looked forward to the invitation. What went on in one of the club meetings? What, what's likely to... Uh, well, you had a, usually had a drink and some light food and had a lot of good conversations. And uh, I think uh, really it was all designed to improve the quality of life in Flint. Was to persuade people to, to become more civic-minded, to be more generous, to help the community fund, and the college and cultural center, and all that type of activity. Because Mike Coleman only had one objective in mind, to make Flint a better place in which to live. And uh, anything having to do with Flint or, or anyone who support Flint, like General Motors, were, you were invited. Being a student at Cranbrook, and my studio was on the second floor, and uh, it was uh, very interesting to see Mike Gorman walking, you know, shoulder to shoulder with Zoltan Sepeshi up and down Academy Row, and I'm saying to myself, well, isn't this something? You know, here, the editor of our uh, local newspaper is here talking to Zoltan Sepeshi, so all these things I am hearing about Mike Gorman being quite a great man are absolutely true. I was quite pleased to um, 
think that he came from Flint. I thought um, I was in awe of him, truthfully, even even to the very end. He, uh, I think, was a great man. Well, being a bachelor, Mike never needed a big house. So this was his house, and this was his basement, and he made it into a club. And that's the size it was, and it served the purpose, because he never had big crowds here. He used how, to... How would you describe what the concept was behind the Club Calumet? I think the concept was where Mike, where Mike could entertain his friends, because he had many, many friends. It was a place he could get people together in small groups to pump their brains and to sell some ideas he had in mind. It was a place they could fellowship, um, occasionally have a little small drink. I remember Art Crowley um, used to be the first kind of the unofficial bartender. He, he was head of consumer power. Oh yes. Usually found Art behind serving, but never any excess drinking or just social drinking. Well, that kind of gives you an idea that it was right here very setting that we're in tonight where the things happened that led to Flint's College and Cultural Center and the Institute of Arts which is going to be featured in this particular segment. What you have to understand about the FIA is that it's really the community's museum because everything is here has come here as a result of the generosity of the people of Flint and a few people outside Flint and it's not any one person's uh, pet project. It's been a community project from the very beginning. And our desire is that more and more of the community take advantage of what we have here. You can walk in our front door without paying a cent. Now, occasionally we will charge for a special program, but uh, by and large, uh, you know, every th the, the permanent collection galleries are always open free of charge. And uh, we want more people to come and enjoy it. it it's a very impressive collection. Uh, it spans the history of art from oh, about the 14th century through the contemporary 20th century. With some uh, very high quality works of art. Some of the earliest things in the collection, uh, even earlier than <clears throat> the 1400s, really, uh, are in our Asian gallery, uh, Chinese and Japanese works of art. Some of those go back to 2000 BC. Uh, for, for Western art, uh, the earliest things are probably the objects housed in the Bray Gallery, <clears throat> which was the gift of Mrs. Viola Bray, who lived here in, in Flint, a very generous woman, uh, who bought a great set of 10 uh, early 17th century French tapestries that had come on the market, <clears throat> that had once uh, belonged to the Barberini family in Rome, and proceeded to uh, provide a gallery to house them, designed specifically to show off the tapestries, and then added uh, period furniture and ceramics and metalwork and all kinds of things to complement the tapestries. Uh, we go on then, we have a small collection. Not, uh, we need to, to do some work in building our collection of uh, old master paintings. That is, say, from the 15th through the early 19th century. Uh, we only have a few things there, but what we have is very good. And then uh, the collection becomes much stronger uh, in the 19th century, especially with French Impressionist paintings, post-Impressionist paintings, School of Paris, uh, paintings and uh, things in America that were being, were being done the same time in America are, are American paintings. Uh, then we get into the 20th century and the, and the collection tends to explode with all kinds of contemporary works of art, sculpture and paintings and prints and, uh, and decorative arts and all kinds of things. We have much more than we can show in the galleries at any one time. From the very beginning, uh, the work of local artists has entered the collection, and it still does, because we feel it's important for us as Flint's Museum to document the history of uh, the fine arts that are made in Flint by people living here. When the Institute was uh, founded, 
in the late 1920s, uh, the, the schools seemed more important uh, in relation to the collection or ex exhibits and things like that, so because at that point, the, the permanent collection consisted of only a handful of, of paintings and, and sculptures. Uh, over the past uh, more than 60 years, the collection has grown tremendously. Until now, it really spans uh, a big part of the whole history of world art. And as the collection has grown, uh, it has tended to become the focus of the uh, FIA, more so than the, the school. However, today we are enrolling more students each year in the four semesters of classes that we offer than ever before in our history. This past year we had upwards of 2,000 students enrolled over the year's time. Uh, as long ago as only three, four years ago, the enrollment was barely half of that. So uh, we think we're offering the community something the community finds uh, valuable, and we're very encouraged at the way our school program is going. Uh, I should explain for people who aren't familiar with it, it's a non-degree granting art school uh, for the community, classes for preschoolers through senior citizens, in just about every art media that you can think of, uh, very uh, high quality faculty. Uh, we try to offer all these courses at modest tuition costs, although as with everything else these days, costs tend to go up a little bit from time to time. So we, th we think the school is very important. I'd like people who come here to visit the museum to go away with something they didn't have before they walked through the front door. Now that can be just a pleasurable experience. It can be some insight uh, into art that they didn't have before, some deeper appreciation. If they come for a lecture, uh, I would hope they'll go away with a little bit more knowledge than they had before. Uh, I'd like the FIA to be looked upon uh, not only as a pleasant place to visit, but a place where people can continue their education. Because in a very real sense, we are an educational institution. But the degree to which people benefit from that is uh, determined by the decisions people make to walk through the front door. But it's all here waiting for the residents of Genesee County. It, uh, it regularly is impressive to out-of-town visitors, and more so now since the renovation and everything is installed in such an impressive uh, way. We've had any number of visitors uh, come since we reopened our doors <clears throat> in June after the renovation. And they, uh, they're, they're, I guarantee you they're impressed and they let us know they're impressed. And they will say some things like, if they've been here before, uh, for instance, one of the most common remarks is, wow, it really looks like a museum now. <laughs> uh, or they'll say, if they haven't been here at all before, I had no idea all this was here in Flint, Michigan. And I, this, it's good to hear those kinds of remarks these days when you hear so many derogatory remarks about Flint. Uh, I would be very happy if the city fathers, for instance, would take uh, a more demonstrable pride in, uh, in the Flint Institute of Art and the whole cultural center. The Cultural Center is a remarkable uh, campus of institutions, the likes of which doesn't exist anywhere else in the United States. We're starting out in late September with a beautiful exhibition of American Impressionist paintings. Uh, that'll be followed by a very unusual show uh, entitled O Appalachia, which is a big exhibition of folk art from the Southern Mountain region of the United States. I think that's going to draw a great deal of interest. Uh, we'll be having then, uh, early in the new year, a uh, rather amazing exhibition uh, of quilts <clears throat> uh, that have been made by uh, Afri African American women in the state of Michigan. It's rather a specialized kind of uh, uh, art creation, but uh, 
really worth saying. We'll also have in conjunction with that a, uh, a rather large exhibition of vintage photographs taken during the 30s and 40s of the major uh, jazz musicians of that age. And uh, along with this, we'll have all kinds of programming and uh, concerts and workshops and lectures and any number of things. And those were exactly the things that the founding members could only hope would come to pass. Now, let's take a look at some other activities in and around Genesee County. Well, we're here at the Flynn Institute of Arts, and we're talking with Sue Walters. Uh, Sue, I understand that you have some shows coming up on Impressionism. Tell us about it. That's right. On Sunday, September 22nd, we'll have three openings. Uh, one, American Impressionism from the Sheldon Memorial Gallery in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, which is at the University of Nebraska. Uh, and along with that, we'll have the curator of that show giving a lecture at 2 p.m., in the auditorium which is free to the public and we invite everyone to come. Now in conjunction with the American Impressionism show we'll have Child Hossum, the printmaker, on exhibition in the Hodge Gallery and so that one can compare the difference between American and French Impressionism we'll have prints from the Albion uh, co College uh, print collection. That sounds exciting, and I understand that the classes that are going on right now, that have already started, you can still register for these classes and call the Institute? That's right. You can get a class schedule by calling the 234-1695, uh, and a, a schedule will be sent to your home, and registration will continue for several weeks. Sounds great, Sue. Well, thank you very much, and uh, right now we're going to go over to the Sloan Museum. On the way, let me tell you about some things happening at Formar. Uh, we're here at the Sloan Museum with Nancy Cook, the education assistant. And Nancy, I understand you have some classes coming up this fall? We do. We have uh, a combination of science and history classes for children and also a few for adults. And the classes um, are for kindergartners through sixth graders. Uh, they're offered on Saturdays and they cover primarily interesting things about Michigan's history and the science ones are done in a classroom in a lab where we do science experiments and we have a good time. And should people be registering for these classes now? Yes, we would like you to pre-register for a class and that can be done by calling the museum at 760-1169 anytime between 9 and 5 o'clock during the week, 12 to 5 on Saturdays and Sundays. Sounds like a lot of fun, Nancy. I'm sure you'll get a lot of calls. It is fun and I enjoy it very much and I enjoy the children and I hope that will translate off to the kids. I'm John Katarski. For all the crew here at Genesee Spotlights, have a great weekend. We'll see you again next Tuesday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write me here at Comcast. Until next time, make it a safe week.